Hi, I'm Bob Mitchell, the CEO of the Global Electronics Council. I am thrilled you've joined us today for this webinar exploring the role of eco-labels in contributing to climate change mitigation. As you may know, we shared some exciting news last week about our organization, NEP, our premier eco-label for differentiating sustainable electronic products and services. In response to the escalating challenge of global climate change, as well as the rapid evolution of the world of electronics products and their supply chains, GEC has been undertaking a multi-year initiative to revise our EP criteria with updated sustainability impact areas. After extensive work between our staff and a multi-stakeholder process, we announced the release of the EP climate criteria last week, specifically focused on encouraging decarbonization of electronic products throughout their life cycle. You'll hear more about this exciting development over the coming hour, as well as how purchasers, manufacturers, policymakers, and other important stakeholders view the impact of eco labels such as EP on the shared imperative to address climate change. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Bob, for getting us started. Um, everyone, welcome. Um, as Bob said, we're so glad that you've joined us today for this webinar on decarbonizing product life cycles, the role of eco labels in contributing to climate change mitigation. I'm Erica Logan, Director for Sustainability Criteria Development at the Global Electronics Council, and I will be the moderator for today's discussion. On the webinar today, we're excited to engage our talented panelists and audience in a conversation about the role of eco labels, such as EP and decarbonization. Before we get started, uh, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, first, this webinar is being recorded. The recording will be available following the webinar. Please feel free to share it with your colleagues. Everyone is on mute today to reduce background noise. If you have questions, we ask that you type them into the questions window. We'll hold questions to the end of the presentations. And please note that if we don't get to respond to your question during the webinar, we will definitely respond by email afterwards. Just briefly, before I introduce our panelists, I'm also really excited to share that just last week, GEC published its updated climate criteria for the EP Eco Label, as our CEO, Bob Mitchell, mentioned in his opening remarks. Um, state of sustainability research served as the foundation for this work, and technical experts representing a balanced set of diverse stakeholder interests worked for over a year to produce the updated criteria including some of the panelists on the call here today. Kate and James, thank you. Uh, the new criteria address measurement of GHG emissions, establishment of GHG reduction targets aligned with climate science, manufacturing energy efficiency, product energy efficiency, renewable electricity sourcing, and reduction of high global warming potential chemicals in upstream manufacturing. Um, a link has been added to the chat, and we're happy to answer any questions during the Q&A part of today's webinar, or of course, separately. So let's dive right in. Next slide, please. Joining me on today's call are James Riddle with HP Inc., Kate Berard with the US Department of Energy, Maria Voralma, I hope I didn't mis mispronounce your name, Maria, with Atia and Verena Radulovic with the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions in Washington, DC. Let me tell you a bit about this very impressive panel. So beginning with James Riddle, lead strategy for HP's Global Supply Chain Environmental Program, managing supplier environmental expectations, supply chain footprinting, and company goal setting, as well as external engagement, including regulations, eco labels, ratings and rankings, and partnering with NGOs. A current work focus is to drive uptake of science-based targets and renewable energy use by HP's suppliers. Also joining us is Kate Brard. Kate is the program manager for electronics stewardship and data centers in the Department of Energy's Office of Sustainable Environmental Stewardship. Kate and her colleagues focus on providing technical assistance, training, and recognition to DOC DOE sites to support meeting sustainability and environmental compliance requirements and goals across numerous operational areas. 
also joining us, Maria Vorama, was part of the Finnish delegation that no negotiated the climate treaty in Paris and worked for the Swedish Energy Agency for several years before she joined ATIA as a climate manager in 2019. Atia is the market leader in IT infrastructure for businesses and public sector organizations in Northern Europe. Atia has over 8,000 employees in 88 cities in the Nordics and Baltics. And finally, but certainly not least, Verena Radulovic is Vice President for Business Engagement at the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions, or C2ES where she works with businesses, policymakers, and other stakeholders to advance business action on climate mitigation and resilience and help galvanize business support for ambitious, practical climate policies and solutions. Verena is also a GEC board member. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, and let me turn it over to James. Um, James, we'll let you get us started. Great, thanks, Erica. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm James Riddle, and uh, my, my focus at HP is on our supply chain and environmental issues. Um, just in case anyone doesn't know HP, we are, are a, uh, a part of the company that was founded as Hewlett Packard Corporation before separating into a couple of, of, of new companies. And, and HP focuses on uh, personal computers and displays, uh, and uh, imaging products like um, laser jet printers, inkjet printers, uh, 3D printers and, and large format printers for the, the graphics industry. Um, and again, I'll, I'll focus mostly on supply chain aspects of, of how these uh, eco-labels like uh, EPEAT work, uh, work for us. So uh, next slide. And actually next slide. There you go. So our our vision uh, uh, for a sustainable impact is to become the world's most sustainable and just technology company. N no big deal, right? Should should be easy. So next slide. And we have several pillars that we 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 put our sustainable impact strategy under. But uh, today we're talking about the EP climate uh, change criteria, uh, and so I'm going to talk about uh, climate action. Uh, we have a number of climate action goals, but particularly in the realm of carbon emissions, again, the focus of, uh, of, of the newly released EP standard, HP has two really prominent goals, um, both of which are either validated by the Science-Based Targets Initiative or, or in process of being so. So by 2030, we look to reduce our value chain greenhouse gas emissions 50% from our baseline year and by 24 achieve net zero value chain emissions. And I wanna underscore the value chain part of that. It's, it's two simple words, but it really means everything. There, there's nothing excluded that's relevant. Our entire supply chain, the use of our products and our own operations. So uh, big, big things to, to bite off and address. Next slide. And so we have key actions uh, that we've identified to achieve our, our climate goals. As we were modeling out how we can how we can do it, we identified certain areas to work in. Um, and, and you can see I've highlighted some in blue here. These are the sorts of things that uh, this latest climate change criteria from EPEAT will will help us address. So uh, just generally decarbonizing our supply chain, but more specifically, you know, using renewables. Uh, and getting our suppliers to reduce their own emissions through target setting, uh, addressing logistics and transportation emissions, and the energy efficiency of our products uh, in the uh, the use phase of our of our scope three. But these other bullets aren't aren't to be lost either. And as as uh, EPEAT uh, rolls out the other modules of the uh, the convergent criteria, uh, we expect that there will also be uh, uh, potentially criteria that are relevant for these other. Um, key actions that HP looks to take uh, to achieve our goals. Next slide. So just quickly to touch on, on what are kind of the key highest level drivers for, for how HP looks at our, our sustainable impact strategy. Um, obviously regulations, no doubt. And then we set our own corporate goals aligned with the, the, the objectives that we want to meet. But then the third bullet there, market access, you know, and you can just kind of redefine market access as EPCO labels. Uh, if our customers have requirements that we must meet in order to sell to them, and uh, looking looking for Kate next to tell us all about that, 
we 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 need to meet those requirements. And so so eco labels are, you know, they're obviously not a compliance requirement like regulations, but they are close in terms of how we think about our, our strategy and what we need to do internally. Uh, uh, as part of our, our sustainable impact strategy. And then of course, reputation and leadership. And, and you could also um, you know, uh, uh, throw eco labels in there as, as best practice frameworks. And um, you know, in, in order to be a leader, you need to be doing the best, right? So next slide. And speaking of external frameworks, um, you know, HP uh, uh, you know, looks to external frameworks to inform that that leadership position, you can see just a, a few on the right. Um, there's there's a lot more uh, listed in our sustainable impact report, and there's a, there's a link at the bottom of the page if anyone wants to go read it. But uh, in terms of eco labels, in 2020, uh, in our fiscal year 21, uh, we had seven billion dollars of of sales associated with product eco labels. Um, you know, so including Energy Star, EP, Blue Angel, uh, and others. Um, and again, we look to frameworks to inform how we, uh, uh, you know, design our strategies. Um, another example of a, of a framework that we look to besides eco labels and these other ones is, uh, is CDP, where we were the only tech company globally to receive a CDP AAA for their three aspects of climate, forest, and water, plus the supplier engagement leaderboard. Uh, and, I, and I believe this is four years in a row for us. So we're, we're really proud of that, but I just wanted to underscore that we look to these sorts of frameworks to inform how we think about our sustainability journey. One, one more example of that would be that, uh, again, if you were to page through our sustainability report, you'd see several references to EPEAT as where we draw uh, um, information to inform some definitions. So there's places where we help define what we're calling sustainable materials based on EP framework. As I'm working with suppliers on renewable energy, um, I need to look to external frameworks like RE100, but also the EP um, criteria on, on credible renewables and credible renewables and supply chain. So, so um, EP is one of the frameworks we, we look to. So next slide. Now I'm going to dig into the value chain and the supply chain. So this is this is HP's uh, uh, emissions chart across uh, uh, you know su supply chain scope three upstream on the left and products and solutions the use of our products scope three downstream on the right and then our operations in the middle and you can see all of the talk that you've been hearing about the real impacts are in the supply chain and if you make electronic products the the use of your products it is all true and HP is not unique here. Um, but it does definitely inform what we know we need to do. 68% of our emissions in our, are in our supply chain. Uh, so next slide, please. And as we look to decarbonize our full value chain with an emphasis on our supply chain, we need to look at how complicated our supply chain is. We have you know, a handful of final assembly suppliers where we have a, a relatively high degree of influence. We still don't own their operations. We still have to influence. But then we have um, over 800 component material suppliers, um, many of which we have uh, direct business relationships with. Um, but then we have thousands of sub-tier suppliers that we have no direct business relationship with. They're, they are upstream of our directly contracted materials and final assembly suppliers. Um, and within these suppliers, I, I said, we have various amounts of influence. These suppliers also have various amounts of, of current uh, maturity in terms of sustainability management. Uh, they all have many customers. They have different relationships with different actors in the supply chain. And so really impacting um, something like greenhouse gas emissions and supply chain, it just has to be a collective effort. No one can do it on their own. So next slide. And so here's really the meat of what I wanted to talk about and how I look at eco labels to help me with my work in supply chains. If you start at the top there, well, if you can think of sort of like a, a virtuous cycle and you, and you start at the top, um, you, you'll have emerging practices. Like we'll say uh, at, at, at one point, um, ISO 50001, you know, uh, well-defined energy management systems was, was a new thing and uh, it was hard to talk to our suppliers about about really effective energy management, but through eco label development, you get 
input from uh, a broad number of stakeholders. You get a, a, a good, pragmatic, robust debate about the pros and cons of different approaches and, and, and how to define things for addressing supply chains. You get a, a reasonable amount of prioritization about what's the most important and, and what can wait for later. Uh, also, what might be a required criterion versus an optional criterion. Um, and then eventually, eco labels, uh, oh, and eco labels also look to external reference standards and sort of help folks like me find those, right? So um, if you look at the, the, um, the new uh, climate criteria, uh, again, talking about ISO 5001, it, it defines what is kind of a credible uh, ISO 5001 and, and how to demonstrate that you have been credibly verified against uh, 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 that certification. So once you've developed this eco label and the criteria in it, it helps align brands. So it becomes an internal business driver for someone like me uh, at a manufacturer. And it, and, it, and it also affects my peers so that we now are having common requests for suppliers. We all want to make these ego labels. We find them as, as, as credible um, uh, frameworks for the behaviors we should be looking for. And because we have these common requests, it magnifies the influence of any individual brand and sends demand signals upstream. When you get to the suppliers, it, it, it acts as an activator. Um, it, it, the suppliers now have uh, pretty clear expectations uh, because the, the ad hoc groups and the technical committees have hashed through what, what is sufficient and, and, and what is not. Uh, and, and then the brands cascade that onto the suppliers and they get aligned expectation from their customers. So this becomes a business driver for the suppliers. There's people just like me who work at my suppliers who now have three or four or five customers all asking for the same thing, possibly something they already knew they wanted to do and would be important for their business and their goals, but now they have demand from their customers uh, and it enables supplier action. And that creates new best business, uh, new best practices in, in the supply chain. So it, uh, uh, by, by having this kind of virtuous cycle up to this point, now something that seemed like it was hard and, and not sure if you wanted to do it, like implementing an energy management system, it, it's now demonstrated that this is possible. And within the IT supply chain, now there's people who understand energy management systems and who are working on it and embedding it in their practices. Um, and as enough companies, enough suppliers do this, it kind of creates a critical mass. Um, someone like me can go back to our other suppliers and say, hey, look, for this label we had, for this eco label, we implemented energy management systems with, say, our final assembly suppliers or our hard disk drive suppliers. And, and they successfully implemented it and we have tangible impacts and we would like to you know, extend this to more. We know it's possible. We know about what it costs. We know the benefits or, or at least we might have some estimate of it. And so now we have new best practices. And then hopefully, we see eco-labels getting refreshed periodically and, and we can repeat the cycle with new, new practices. So this is, this is just the James Riddle take on, on the value I see from my position, but um, hopefully, hopefully others see this and, and, um, and, and I'm right about this. So next slide. So this is my last slide and, and I'll just leave you with this, this picture of uh, going, on, we're all kind of going out on a journey now that this criteria has been published and, and congratulations to everyone who was involved and to EP and to my colleagues who all worked on this. Uh, and you know, good luck to all of us now in implementing it. And I just wanted to give a shout out from the supply chain perspective that uh, if you look at the first criterion I worked on, the, the imaging, the, 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 the the, the still current imaging products, that there's effectively no supply chain criteria. There might be some, but it's not really much. Um, but as we've progressed through the most recent personal systems um, criteria or PCs, and now this convergent criteria for climate change, 74% of the optional points available are for addressing supply chain uh, uh, climate impacts. Um, the, the remainder are, are product requirements and, and manufacturer requirements. Um, and of course, there's a required criterion, which address all of these things also, but really worth noting the heavy shift towards supply chains. Uh, we all understand we're in this together and, um, and, and we really need to get, get cracking on, on decarbonizing supply chains. So that's, that's what I have and, and thank you for listening. And I'm looking forward to hearing the, uh, the presenters. James, thank you so much. Um, 
really helpful presentation and, and appreciate you sharing how eco labels can influence uh, manufacturer sustainability goals and, and your supply chain. And I also particularly liked your comment about pragmatic debate um, during criteria development. We certainly had plenty of that. <laughs> there is that for sure. But it's all it's all good. Um, so thank you. Um, and, and with that, um, Kate, um, are you with us? Please. Um, Yep, Please absolutely. Jump, I am here. Jump in. Great. Great. Thank you so much. You can actually go to the next slide, which is my title slide. Thank you. So I am talking about decarbonizing product life cycles and eco labels from the federal purchaser perspective. So I was, was mentioned in the beginning, I'm with the US Department of Energy. Next slide. And the time to really focus on, focus on this is now. Uh, we as a federal government, but also at the Department of Energy have engaged in sustainable acquisition for quite some time, since the 1990s, starting with recycled paper that evolved into a more broad life cycle approach of electronic stewardship in the early 2000s. And now we are part of a whole government approach to focus on getting to net zero emissions procurement by 2050. Next slide. And this is the web of requirements that is helping to support us get to our goals. So as the federal government and the executive branch, um, a lot of our direction comes from the president. And in this particular case, um, the president laid out a number of executive orders related to sustainability, climate change mitigation, and in particular with 14057, how the federal government is supposed to operate in a sustainable manner and encourage sustainability both within the government but also across uh, u.s business and other things that we engage in so out of that executive order come a number of other things that also support our work first we're implementing instructions so while the executive order was a handful of pages long the implementing instructions are 73 pages which outline what specific steps the federal agencies are supposed to take in trying to meet uh, these sustainability goals. And there is both a section on sustainable acquisition in the implementing instructions and also a section on electronic stewardship, which specifically calls out the use of EP. Those directions are codified in various ways in different agencies. Here at DOE, we have a directives um, policy and we put all of these new requirements into our revised DOE order 436.1 uh, called departmental sustainability, which helps identify uh, our goals and roles and responsibilities for meeting all of these requirements. There's also a federal sustainability plan which came out of the executive order, which is a very high level look at how uh, the key actions that federal agencies are going to take to meet these goals. There is a section specific to net zero emissions procurement by 2050. Um, again, those goals flow down into a sustainability plan that we have for ourselves here at BOE. And then we also actually require all of our sites to have individual site sustainability plans so that we're really making sure that those requirements are getting all the way down to the people in the field. Out of the executive order also um, came requirements to use EPA's recommendations of specification standards and eco labels. If you have not heard of this, uh, these are a set of specification standards and eco labels that EPA recommends for federal procurement. Uh, the recommendations are across a broad number of categories, but there is specifically an electronics category. And right now, um, EP registered products are the recommendation that EPA is making for all federal purchasers. And then also, in addition to there being an executive order, many of these requirements are being codified in our actual regulations. So we have a federal acquisition regulation that is specific to our procurement uh, that outlines these requirements. And then farther down from that, we have a DOE acquisition regulation. Um, both of those both lay out the requirements, but also provide a specific contract language that we can put into our um, contracts and specifications. Next slide. So the key actions I wanna pull out from all of those documents um, within the executive order and the implementing instructions uh, there is specific direction, as I mentioned, to purchase sustainable products and services identified or recommended by EPA. So EPA maintains that list, and then federal agencies are to go to that list when they are purchasing a product um, that might have a recommendation and use those recommendations. 
In addition to that, we are also more broadly required to reduce our contractor emissions and embodied emissions in the products acquired or used in federal projects. So this is more of a broad direction to make sure that we are looking to decarbonize across our entire supply chain. And within the federal sustainability itself, um, not only we're we supposed to purchase products recommended by EPA, but we really are more specifically supposed to maximize procurement of sustainable products and services. So this is not just something that we would like to do when we can do it, but something that we should be doing to the maximum extent practicable. Uh, there is also a direction in the federal sustainability plan to actually change the federal procurement rules so that we are minimizing the risk of climate change. And that is a much longer process, as you can probably imagine, uh, to update how we go about our procurement to really look at getting into the decarbonization of our supply chain and also factoring in the social cost of carbon. So those are activities that are definitely underway. Um, they are fairly complicated, as I'm sure you can imagine, um, but we are happy to have a lot of different tools to help us get there. Next slide. Including eco-labels. So eco-labels is a key tool for federal agencies um, in meeting all of these goals. As I mentioned, they're, they're very big picture, they're very ambitious, um, and it could be a lot of work to try and decarbonize our entire supply chain. So we use eco-labels to make that job a bit easier. Why? Well, there's a couple of different reasons. Uh, one is that we're required to. Federal agencies must use private sector standards and conformity assessment and procurement. Um, uh, there's an act and an OMB circular that require us to not make our own standards um, when there are credible private sector standards and labels available. So that again connects back to EPA's recommendations. The second, as you can imagine with all of these requirements that have been coming out, and um, all of the talk about what we are doing to decarbonize our supply chain and, and enhance sustainable acquisition, many people have come out of the woodwork to offer to sell us things that are green and sustainable. And we look to eco labels to help us avoid greenwashing. Um, and I, I love that James said, credible eco labels, because that's really where we are, um, where we are gaining our value, is making sure we are working with organizations that are using credible processes have credible criteria that lead to our goals and that we can use to make sure we are not getting greenwash and that we are actually buying sustainable products. One of the great things about eco labels is we also can address multiple attributes with a single procurement requirement. So for instance, before EPEAT, if we wanted to cover everything that was covered by an EPEAT registered product, we'd have to list out all of the different characteristics that we would want in, for instance, a computer like energy efficiency and low toxicity and recycled content and take back. And that is an awful lot of contract language to standardize and also make sure that our purchasers get into our contracts and into our purchasing orders. The great thing about a credible eco-label is instead we can just specify the eco-label and not have to get into the details of all of the different characteristics that we would like. So multi-attribute eco-labels has been really helpful, particularly as we are looking at the life cycle of products, the decarbonation, decarbonization of the supply chain, which involves a lot of different actions, um, and, and just competing priorities when it comes to sustainable attributes. And then I, I kind of touched on this, but basically eco-labels allow us to rely on the work done by credible organizations to assess and verify claims. Um, EP does a lot of work to uh, make sure that the products on the registry are verified as meeting all of these different attributes and that's work that we don't have to do and then in many cases we we wouldn't have time to do as you can imagine as the federal government we have a lot of varied missions and we certainly want to do the right thing in sustainable acquisition but it can be difficult difficult if we have to assess each individual product against multiple attributes that we are trying to meet next slide so getting from here to there through net zero, I mentioned at the beginning, we've been doing sustainable procurement since the 1990s and electronic stewardship since the 2000s. And that sort of serves as our baseline. So we have requirements to buy Energy Star certified, low standby power and EPEAT registered electronics. I also threw in here some related requirements 
We need to buy recycled and refurbished toner cartridges and recycled content paper, uh, paper going back to the 90s as a requirement. And those are baseline requirements that we have been operating on for over a decade now, um, and in some case, multiple decades. So we have a good handle on specifying these products and getting these products so that we can meet um, our sustainability goals. We are pushing towards, from that baseline, towards leadership. And in the case of EP, DOE, um, and actually the Federal Acquisition Regulation, encourage our purchasers to buy the highest EP registration tier available. And we understand there are sometimes some ups and downs in the registration because of changes to standards, um, but we want, we really want our purchasers to look at the best of the best that they can get through the registry and encourage them to use the language to get their, the highest registration tier available. Um, also, we are very excited to be looking to be able to use the early adopter status for the new climate criteria that is coming out which will help dif differentiate among all of the great EP products to those products that are actually going to help us further our specific goals with regards to decarbonization of our supply chain and addressing our climate change mitigation concerns. So we look forward to uh, that coming out this fall and being able to educate our purchasers on how they can use that um, to meet our goals and then and demonstrate that we are all working together towards this. And that ultimately these actions and other actions like it will lead us to our goals, hopefully, which again is net zero emissions procurement by 2050, which sounds far off, but is not far off when you're talking about changing your entire supply chain and changing the supply chain of the largest purchaser uh, um, in the United States. Uh, the other thing that I had mentioned before is this goal of consideration of the social cost of carbon, which is another complicated thing, which really is going to take some time to make sure that we uh, make happen. However, it is a very worthwhile goal and I think we are all making our best efforts to move in that direction. And I believe that is it for me. Next slide. My contact information for later on, but I look forward to hearing from everyone else and to questions at the end. Kate, thank, thank you so much. Um, so interesting, really um, appreciate hearing a uh, U.S. federal government perspective on the role of eco-labels and decarbonization. I also appreciate your explanation of how requirements uh, move from the president to the, to the field um, and how all that comes together. So thank you. Um, Maria, um, we'll let you uh, take it from here. Yes, thank you very much. So my name is Maria Buaroma. Uh, good job with giving that a shot, Erika. Uh, I'm originally from Finland and hence the complicated last name, but I've uh, been living in Sweden and working in Sweden for the last seven years and at Thea for uh, three years. Uh, next two slides, please. So uh, Atea, just shortly about uh, Atea. Uh, Atea is a the biggest reseller of IT products in the Nordic uh, or Northern European market, so Nordics and the Baltics. And we like to say that we want to build a sustainable future with IT. Uh, we, as, as I said, we're a big reseller of both hardware, software, but we have a, a big fleet of uh, consultants. And we've divided our business into three main business areas, which is digital workplace, uh, so offering devices for our customers to do their job that they need to do, hybrid platforms, uh, seeing to it that those devices uh, work and they can do what they need to do with them, and then information management and how that can support uh, a sustainable future. Uh, as mentioned, next slide, uh, Northern Europe uh, is uh, not a set uh, definition, but uh, covers the Nordic countries, Finland, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, and uh, also uh, the Baltic countries where we have offices and, uh, and um, colleagues in all of these countries. Next slide, please. Altogether, we're uh, a bit over 8,000 employees. Um, 88 offices, and when we talk about the Nordics or, or the Nord Northern Europe, it's uh, different countries, but if we put uh, all of the Nordic countries together, it add up, adds up and becomes the 10th largest economy in the world. 
and said we are number one uh, in this, this economy. So we do have a lot of customers, a lot of knowledge about the expectations of the Nordic uh, IT customers. Uh, I could have added a picture of uh, ASEA sustainability work after listening to James, I realized that I should, but I can mention that uh, we've also been listed at the Global 100 uh, list by the Corporate Knights, so recognized as one of the most sustainable companies uh, in the world, uh, the most sustainable in our own sector. Uh, we have an Ecovadis rating, and I'm not actually sure if this is completely public yet, but I think I can mention that we just got a confirmation that we've reached the platinum level for this year as well, for the first year, uh, consecutive year, as long as the platinum level has existed. So being in the top 1% of the companies being rated by Ecovadis. Uh, we've had an SPTI since uh, 2018, uh, but we've actually um, heightened our ambition when it comes to climate uh, goals since then. So we are in the process of updating that SPTI as we speak uh, to reflect that ambition. And what else, James, did you say? No, oh, I think you get the picture. But next slide, please. I think what's most uh, interesting that I can share with you is not really what Atea does. Uh, so we don't produce uh, equipment ourselves. Uh, we support our customers, we have strategic partners, uh, so we have this um, quite unique position to have all this market knowledge from the, the customer base that we have in the Nordics, and also being this advisor that is not connected to a specific brand or a specific product, but can represent uh, the, the IT, IT sector uh, in large. And this gives us a great position in, in the ecosystem, um, listening to the Nordic markets, uh, giving that intel to, to the international IT companies, and also coming back to the Nordic markets about what is possible today. For that, we have a platform that we call ASEA Sustainability Focus, where we collect the, the common um, will, if, if we will, for sustainability uh, of the IT buyers. We have a, an, um, a survey that we send out, uh, not only to our customers, but any IT buyer in the Nordic uh, and the Baltic countries. And we collect that information uh, and um, boil that down to a, a report that is published uh, once a year. Uh, it's not Atea who actually takes this information, but we have an advisory board consisting of IT buyers in the Nordics that take these um, this market intel and, and boils it down to recommendations to the industry of what the Nordic buyers want when it comes to sustainability. Uh, for a few years now, we've, we've asked for, for example, like the most pressing uh, issues uh, when it comes to sustainability. And we were a bit surprised that it wasn't the social um, uh, questions that, that we still have in, in our industry. Um, but the most important question for uh, the Nordic countries at the moment is mitigating climate change. We have a theory about that. We think uh, for the Nordic markets, transparency is extremely important and working with the system, uh, social uh, sustainability questions are important, but it's more seen as a, as a hygiene factor, something that is expected of everyone to work with and something where we really haven't reached the full potential uh, would be the climate sector. So that's why we believe that that's one that they've raised like as the most important one. Um, but then there's like uh, some challenges to how do you work with uh, climate mitigation and our customers, they would want to they come to us and they ask like, should I buy this laptop or this laptop? This has a smaller carbon footprint than this one. So that must be good, right? And we advise them that yes, it's definitely good for us for that data. But today where we are with developing the methodologies of carbon footprint accounting for IT equipment, it's, uh, it's a bit more complicated than that. There's methodological differences, there's communication differences about those numbers. So you can't really use that to um, compare 
one product from one producer to another product from another producer. You can use it for, for comparing within one producer using the same methodology, using the same communication around those numbers. Um, but yeah, you can't really take it just like that. So I was really happy to see uh, if it's new recommendations on, on uh, sorry, not recommendations, uh, criteria uh, for the climate, uh, recognizing that that it's it's good that these numbers exist and that they are publicly uh, available because then uh, you can um, get a picture of of what goes into them and and. Um, and have an understanding of, of that, but but not saying that there should be a, a specific um, level of that or, or something like that, because today that's that's not possible. But we do encourage uh, that these numbers are being uh, published. So I think it's great that you've added added that there. Um, another thing that our customers they they do want. They do have very high sustainability ambitions. They do want to cover the whole Agenda 2030, and they come to us with a long list of criteria that they want to set in their uh, their uh, recruitments. And we go back and ask, how are you going to follow up on all of these uh, of this wish list that you have? Uh, will will you have the resources to actually follow up on these? And the answer many times is no. Uh, and in that case, those criteria they're not worth that much because if you can't follow up on them, um, then you, you can't know that if if it actually has made a difference that you've posed that criteria. So that's another reason to why we um, uh, suggest that our customers to, to make it easier for them that they would ask for eco-labeled products. So if we go to the next picture, uh, all of this market intelligence we boiled down to uh, a report and I want to emphasize that this is for kind of those starting off with uh, sustainability criteria. What are the most important issues to focus on? And I'm saying this because uh, uh, this presentation is focusing on the EPEAT criteria, but we have mentioned the TCO criteria. So uh, that's one of the reasons it's um, kind of a bit easier to, to start with. But uh, yeah, so again, I think the, the climate criteria that it, uh, you've developed um, are really also focusing on the, on the correct uh, questions here. So um, following up on, um, on how we can um, move the whole sector, that's where we have a recommendation to uh, that the so that the manufacturer are a member of the Responsible Business Alliance, which is uh, the or the industry organization for uh, setting um, codes of conduct for, for following this in the whole supply chain, like James was earlier mentioning that that's really where we want to uh, make an impact. Then the other point, as said, buy certified equipment, because it makes your life so much more easier. And last but not least, and this is a bit of a hard one, include take back sure it's easy to put into practice that you have that already when you when you buy uh, it um, equipment and services but it's it's more than that it's it's really actually taking a step back and thinking about the needs that you have instead of just buying the 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 service that you think you need so really go through your needs and have a plan for um, the whole life cycle of of the equipment that you uh, for crew. This guide is uh, available online and as I said this is like the beginner's handbook but we do have oh and I see you posted the links in the chat thank you very much um, but we do have also a, a group of buyers because we have very ambitious and buyers uh, as well which is called uh, leadership for change where they share best practices with each other um, and how to push the needle a bit further and they have just launched their first uh, best practices for uh, um, extending the, the lifespan of the product. And a fun fact in that, the last point in that guide, or, or the, the best practice is also to look at eco labels and see what they can do uh, for you in, in pushing that, um, that criteria. 
think that was all for me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, I really, we all really appreciate the opportunity to learn more about ATIA. Um, and also it's fascinating to hear what the sustainability topics are that are of interest to your customers, to, to the buyers of IT in the Nordics. Um, fascinating, so thank you. And Verena, please come back on camera and um, help us tie it all together. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me okay, Erica? Yes. Great. Um, well, thanks so much for having me join today. And I don't actually have any slides, uh, so you can keep looking at my photo or you can <laughs> just have me focus over here. Um, but one thing I think just kind of tie in what um, our panelists talked about is if I can pull back and provide some additional context for why this new criteria is really exciting and I think speaks to the moment of where we are um, in expectations of corporate sustainability, but where this can actually be a way to drive improvements in other key industries and sectors. So one, just to kind of pull back, um, thinking back to the, the first presentation from our speaker from HP, when we look at corporate goals that incorporate supply chain um, measures, uh, there are several thousand companies out there that are reporting on their scope three emissions. I think at least 12,000 companies report to the CDP. And under this, the, the science-based targets initiative, over 2,600 companies have SBTI approved targets. And about 5,000 companies total are taking action on climate that is moving in the direction of um, a science-based target. And so with that, the, the expectation is that scope three is included. If it's more than, um, I think, 40% of your impact, um, it needs to be included in your goal. And the fact that the criteria speaks to that is really important and, and aligns with a lot of expectations that are out there um, on corporate leadership. The other sort of things that are happening in the ecosystem is the proposed, there, there are sort of three, two proposed US rules. There's a, a rule that is coming in Europe that it is working on being finalized in terms of the, the, the specifics. And that is in the US, the Securities and Exchange Climate Disclosure Rule, which is currently in the process of being um, assessed and finalized. There is the FAR Council had a proposed rule where U.S. business, U.S. suppliers to the federal government, particularly those with over $50 million um, in business, would be required to, set, to develop not only their scope one and two inventories, but their scope three inventory and set um, set ambitious targets. The one that was proposed was a science-based target specifically. Um, and then in the SEC rule, you know, it, it asks, you know, what are companies doing broadly on climate and to incorporate any um, information on scope three targets as well as their goals. That hasn't been finalized yet, so we don't know what is going to happen. But if it does, you know, criteria like this, you know, and um, is no longer uh, sort of a nice to have, but really will become a requirement for, for disclosure. And even if it doesn't make it into the final rule, the, the expectation among businesses are is wherever your impacts are material, and as we saw um, in the HP slides earlier, where the impacts of the electronics um, from a life cycle perspective lie, the expectation is that, that those would be included. I think there's something, another thing that is sort of important to keep in mind and remember that the electronics industry has been kind of at the forefront of sustainability for a long time. And EPEAT has been around since 2000 and I think it was 2006. Um, it's gone through several updates and iterations. And, um, and now with this climate change mitigation criteria, it again further aligns with what expectations are. But in, in incorporating these different pieces, um, there are actually potential benefits and knock-on benefits throughout the value chain. Um, what we're seeing with the Inflation Reduction Act and with the administration more broadly um, is an incentive incentives, procurement incentives for the federal government in other materials from hard to abate sectors. And one thing to remember is that the experience that we've seen with EPEAT is that by including multiple attributes and multiple um, ways to make it easy for the, the procurement official to, to do the right thing um, can potentially be a lesson learned for other sectors and industries that are beginning to move in this direction. But there are pieces of the, of the criteria that I think are important to highlight. One, which is um, calling for a reduction in, in supply chain transportation emissions. There's a lot of um, current best practices. Uh, SmartWay, uh, EPA SmartWay program is referenced. Um, but there are also a, a real efforts being made at low carbon fuels, at electrification, and how can uh, criteria like this help drive and advance 
innovations in, in transportation, whether it be shipping or whether it be land transportation, air, air transportation, et cetera. The other area where we look at and see a lot of the impacts of electronics is in the manufacturing. And a lot of times that comes sometimes come back, comes back to the processing of raw materials and in the in, in the manufacture of the products themselves. In the processing of raw materials, there is an effort, you know, afoot a across the countries to really look at hard to abate sectors, um, the production of steel, the production of aluminum. Um, how can you know we create more demand for low carbon products and incorporating a requirement, you know, or, or, a, or looking at ways to sort of have key suppliers reduce emissions, report on emissions reductions, embedding that in, that kind of an approach in a eco standard is really important as another way to signal demand into the marketplace, even if it's really far upstream in the value chain where you can't see it. Um, having it in there, you know, it, can, it adds adds to more um, more of a demand signal. And in the case of renewable energy, there is always um, a need for demand for more and more renewables, both here in the United States in terms of how renewables are cited and where they're uh, where they're sourced, but also uh, this is really where the electronics industry has been at the forefront is engaging suppliers in countries that don't have the market mechanisms that we have here in the United States to begin to implement renewable energy. So a lot of renewable energy deals that we're seeing from the private sector in other countries, particularly where electronics are manufactured in different Asian, Asian countries, has been led by um, companies in the electronics sector trying to figure out ways to create a power purchasing agreements or other on-site deals um, in areas where the markets are underdeveloped. And that's really important um, because it can also send policy signals to those countries that there is a demand for renewable energy from major um, major manufacturers that, that supply to global markets. And so that really brings it into not only the national conversation on like finding, you know, complementing ways that the administration is looking to reduce emissions from hard to abate sectors, but also uh, an, an international um, interest and desire in, in, in creating greater renewable energy markets um, and products in other countries. So the long tail or so the back end of these kind of eco labels is really significant. And I think, you know, keeping in mind that, that there's a lot more uh, sectors and industries that are catching up to the conversation, um, I think enables uh, this criteria to be extra relevant um, to a broader climate conversation. So with that, Erica, I realize we have a couple minutes left for questions. I will turn it back over to you. We do, we have a couple of minutes left. Thank you so much, Rena, and, and thanks for giving us a perspective on how the electronics industry uh, serves as a role model and leads by example to other um, sectors. We tend to be kind of myopic on, on our world, um, but there's a whole broader industry world out there. So thank you for providing that, that perspective. Um, and yes, we have a few minutes for questions. So let me, let me see what we have here. Once again, we'll do as many as we can, a couple minutes here, and then we'll follow up. Um, and if I could ask our speakers to come back on camera, um, if you're able. I know Kate is with us, I believe, but not able to come back on camera. And Kate, I think this this one is a good one for you. It's um, how do you encourage purchasers to go beyond minimum requirements and purchase the most sustainable products available? I know you spoke to this somewhat, but. Yeah, great. Thanks, Eric. Erica. Um, so in addition to all of our requirements, we do have a number of programs that help to encourage our federal purchasers to sort of go beyond the bare minimum. And in particular at DOE, we have what's called the Green Bias slash Green Space Award Program, where we recognize our purchasers that have not only bought sustainable products that meet required attributes, but also products that um, are the, considered the most sustainable in the marketplace. So we're really excited to be able to add their early adopter criteria um, for EPEAT to those requirements um, in the next couple of years. It's a, it's a multi-year program to develop the requirements and then put them out, but we do give out annual awards and most of our sites um, apply for awards and have gotten multiple awards. And I think that's a good way to help encourage going um, beyond just the bare minimum, but also things like this where we provide education about why it's important uh, can really motivate people to do the best that they can do in purchasing, especially when there are opportunities to do so that are so easy through using eco labels. Excellent, thank you. Can I comment on that? I think peer-to-peer -peer pressure is very important as well. 
as I mentioned, the, the picture that I showed you is like the basic uh, level that we suggest. Then if you go into the guide, there's like more uh, ideas, but then the leadership for change, that's like the most ambitious customers in the Nordic countries and they're pushing each other uh, and also at the same time aligning their criteria. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, let me try to squeeze in at least one more. Uh, Verena, I think this is a good one for you. Um, what challenges might the electronic sector encounter with the proposed SEC requirements if the rule includes much of what was proposed? Oh, Verena, you're on mute. Sorry, here we go. In that case, um, if they do include scope three emissions, which would presumably be given a safe harbor different from the scope one and two emissions, since a lot of those emissions are coming from suppliers, it's really hard to get a good grasp on that data, particularly the further back you get in the supply chain. So I think being comfortable with estimated data, understanding kind of what is the, what are the material, what are the important, significant, relevant, impactful emissions to report. So maybe not focusing on all the all the the minutia throughout your supply chain, but really focusing on the big areas um, where, where your impacts lie. But that that may also occur in the, in the context of the C, um, uh, CSRD, which I'm um, Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive in Europe, that is also asking for um, impacts throughout the value chain. So I think, you know, asking for this information, you know, is one thing for an eco label asking for it because you are on the hook for reporting it for yourself um, to to a a regulator is is coming. And so I think just being comfortable with that and not knowing what they know and what they don't know is important. I appreciate that. Oh, I so wish we had more time <laughs> for Q&A and discussion because um, there's some here for, for James and Maria as well. But we are just about at the top of the hour. Um, so I want to say thank you to our, to our panelists and I want to say thank you to our audience um, and for all of your questions. Please note that later today you'll receive a follow-up email with a link to today's webinar recording. Um, and again, thanks for joining us. Please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you, Erica. Take care. Thank you.